My name is Rob Harris, and um, I currently chair the training committee for, for FACET. And I've been involved in uh, safety netting now for the previous 10 years uh, as, a, as a manufacturer, as a trainer, and as an assessor. FACET is the industry body for safety nets, and it currently uh, is the voice of the industry. It's a bit like the NASC is to scaffolding, the NFRC is to, to roofing, and like IPAP is to, to MUP. It's the voice of, of the industry. We have approximately 40 members, member companies, and all those member companies um, may contribute to uh, working groups and committees that um, aim to try and, and maintain and improve industry best practice. So FACET is the voice of the, the netting, netting industry. What I'd like to do is talk to you about um, the, the way we get people out of safety nets. Um, someone mentioned earlier, when someone goes into a net, then, then something has happened. There's been a reportable incident into a net. And what we need to do is consider how we rescue people out of those nets. This is a huge subject and one which, which may conclude with the scenario that if you can't evidence an effective rescue from within a safety net, then perhaps a safety net is not the appropriate solution for working at height. What we will conclude is that long before the first tie rope is attached to the net and attached to the structure, that we have to make sure that there is a workable rescue plan in place. And that rescue plan will have a number of components, including um, the people involved in the process and including the equipment that we're going to use. So before we go into the detail, I want to talk about how a safety net works and where they're used talk about the regulations, um, the work at height regulations in particular, and then finally some nitty gritty on the issues surrounding getting people out of safety nets. One thing I can't tell you is exactly what to do in every scenario. A building site, a building, a structure is always changing, it's always moving, it's like the lava from a volcano. So what I can do though, or what I will be able to do, it suggests some issues that you need to add to a list of things that you need to consider. So safety net works, normally they're polypropylene or nylon uh, material. It's a mesh material, knotted or knotless. And the idea is that we erect a safety net as close as possible to the worker's feet or the working level. What that means is that when the individual falls, he falls into the safety net, and the safety net um, stretches, or in a knotted net, the knots tighten, but that minimizes the loads that occur on the body, and it minimizes the loads that get transferred back to, to the structure. And what you'll find is that once the person has fallen into the safety net, and we take him out, what you'll find is that the net will stay permanently deformed. So the safety net, in simple terms, is like a driver's airbag. Once it's been used once, it's, it's done its job and needs to be replaced, in principle. So some of the issues that we need to consider with safety nets are, are numerous, but three that I'll pick on is, the first is the maximum fall height. The maximum fall height from the guy's feet in the European standard is six meters, which is a big distance. But what you find in the UK is we always work to position the net as close as possible. We also need to consider the distance we have below the net because the net, when you fall into it or load the net, it will stretch. So we need to consider how much we expect the net to stretch and we call that clearance distance. It's the area below the net. And there's no point in fixing a net to something that's designed to catch somebody if what you fix it to isn't strong enough. So we need to consider the anchorage point and typically we're looking at tying to big structural steel work, I sections, C sections, cold rolled steel, that kind of thing, hot rolled steel, that kind of thing. Um, and the loadings we require are six kilonewtons at 45 degrees. 
So safety nets in use will look something like this. This guy working on the concrete slab has got the net positioned very close to the underside. If he falls, he falls a small distance. Rigged in roofing, uh, a lot of nets are rigged uh, for the benefit of roofers. Again, tied to the structure that's strong enough that take the load, rigged as close as possible. The full distance that the guy will experience will be the depth of the steel and the, the, the initial sag of the, the safety net. And again, another roofing example. As you can see, that every time we always position the net as close as possible. So, planning for rescue from a safety net. The work at height regulations came in in 2005. They aim to reduce the opportunities for falls from height or falls at work. And they do this by focusing on, on work practices that avoid an individual being at height. The work at height regs are very uh, they're goal setting, they're non-prescriptive, and they always aim to reduce the opportunity uh, of people working at height. Work at height regs also identify duty holders, and the duty holders will be employers, employees, and what's called workplace controllers. And a workplace controller in a construction site would be perhaps the site manager or a project manager. On a building, facilities management, the facilities manager would be the workplace controller. It's the people, the person that directs people to, to carry out some work. They go on to say that we need to consider how we get someone out. We need to consider timely, evacu timely evacuation and, and rescue in an emergency. And a fall into a safety net is an emergency. They go on to say that every employer should make sure that work is planned properly and that planning must include how we get people out of a safety net. So it's the work at height regulations that are saying we need to do something about um, getting people out of safety nets. What is often overlooked is that rigging a safety net is a work at height activity. Um, we have a rigger working at height, rigging a safety net. Um, so he is no more or less important than the person that he's rigging the net for. So the rigger needs to be rescued, perhaps from a working platform or from a, from a cherry picker. Um, if he's working off ropes, there needs to be a rescue plan for that. If he's working off towers, there needs to be a rescue plan for that. So, so planning for rescue includes the, the safety net rigger himself. I mentioned earlier that what I can't do is give you a shopping list of this is exactly what you do every time someone falls into a safety net. What I can do is give you a list of about eight or nine things that you need to consider. When we run workshops for particularly construction companies and we give them a list of um, issues that they need to consider, you'll find that even in, within the same company, they will always put the following in a different order. So always be aware of and understand the rescue plan. As I mentioned, long before the first tie rope is tied on a safety net, someone needs to have prepared and written a rescue plan. Someone needs to make sure the people involved in that rescue plan know what their function is, and someone needs to know what equipment is needed to rescue those people. We need to consider the casualty. A competent person needs to determine whether it's appropriate to attempt rescue. One thing we can't do is we can't have a rescue plan that simply relies upon dial 999. Um, but a competent person may decide we need to contact the emergency services. Consider the rescuer's safety. There's no point sending someone in a hazardous area if they're going to be at risk themselves. So we need to make sure the rescuer is safe as well. If, for example, the rescue plan says get a cherry picker or a scissor lift, you need to make sure that that equipment is available on site. If the rescue plan says in this scenario you use a stretcher board, 
someone needs to make sure there is a stretcher board or a rescue board available. Once we've dealt with the casualty, we need to work out where that casualty station is going to be. And then finally, we need to report the load into the safety net. So there's a list there of eight things that, that we need to consider. Um, but you will find that there's more and more and more as you, if you, as you start trying to consider how to get people out of the safety net. So there's about four ways of rescuing people from a safety net. The first way is when an individual falls within a safety net and most people that fall into a safety net in the UK simply self-recover and they clamber out the net like children do in a cargo net in a play area. What you need to consider is that you can't simply walk out of the net. If you imagine as you work from the middle of the net to the side of the net, the further you walk to the edge of the net, the steeper the catenary becomes, which means it's very difficult for someone to simply step out of the safety net. So in my experience, it would be sensible to say that you don't self-rescue unless that person is able to clamber out on all fours. If we have a situation where we have what's called a close floor, where the safety net, once a person's in the safety net, is within about a metre, maybe a metre and a half from the floor, then if he has a knife with him, perhaps he can self-rescue by cutting the mesh and stepping, simply stepping through the net to the floor below. If he can't do that, perhaps what he can do is get two colleagues to help him. And what they could do is get a stretcher board or a piece of scaffold board or a piece of timber and they could support that guy standing holding the sheet and support the person cut the mesh and bring him down to the ground that's another way that we can do that surprisingly for a lot of people once a person has loaded the net two people can walk into the net and help the person out so rescue from above can be affected by two people walking from the diagonals to the, to the casualty. What they could do is choose to uh, administer first aid or simply help the person walk out of the safety net. So at that point in time, you'll have three people exiting the safety net. A principal contractor recently um, challenged the rescue plan of the, um, the rigging company and the roofing company and said, prove to us that your rescue plan works. And so we delivered uh, a workshop training program where we got a, an individual within a safety net. We then walked in with two guys and those two guys were able to hold on to something to steady themselves as they walked into the safety net. At this point, they could choose to administer first aid or they could choose to walk out of the safety net. And quite simply, this guy walked out the safety net with the two other helpers. And again, remember, as you walk to the edge of the safety net, these guys need to clamber out because of the catenary, the steepness of the, uh, the, the, the position of the net. Finally, <clears throat> the last way that we rescue people is from below. And the, 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 the process goes like this. We have a faller into a safety net and someone assesses the condition of the faller and assesses, assesses the, the rescue of safety. Can that rescue be carried out safely? And in this scenario, we're going to source an appropriate mobile access tower, uh, MUP or scissor lift and what we'll do then is attach a board to the bucket of that uh, cherry picker and we'll tie that bucket to a board and take the board up to the faller. Once we're located with the faller, again, we could administer first aid if that's appropriate. Or alternatively, what we could do is we could tie the board, which in turn is tied to the bucket, to the faller and then we cut around the uh, safety net and we bring the basket and the faller down. 
So that's rescue from, from below. And a question that often gets asked is, how do we affect rescue from below with a cherry picker when there is no cherry picker on site? This goes back to what I was saying earlier. You need to make sure that you plan for rescue and have the equipment to carry it out. So in this scenario, we could, with that current picture, we could operate a scissor lift or a mupe, and we could affect rescue. But at the far end of the building, what about if the main contractor has dug out excavations or they've poured a concrete slab? It may be that at that point in time, nobody can access the faller because the access equipment isn't suitable. In this scenario, we have a person in a mupe. Um, if the mupe um, gets, uh, breaks down or has a problem or there's a problem with the casualty, with the, with the operator, we need to consider how we, we get that worker down. Rescuing from a cherry picker from the ground controls in this scenario is quite difficult. So rescue must be workable at all stages of the construction phase. So in summary, we never plan to fall, but we must always plan to rescue. The rescue plan must be written a long time before the first tie rope is tied. We must make sure the rescue safety is in place and we always assess the condition of the faller. Involve emergency services necessary. Talk to the emergency services before you start building with safety nets. Identify the rescue route, what you're going to do when you get the casualty to the ground. Identify the casualty station. Always report the loads into a net. Remember a safety net is similar to a driver's airbag, it's a once only use. And the list goes on, etc., 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 etc. Every course we run, we always add to this list. So don't select a safety net solution unless a faller can be rescued. Planning for rescue involves many people and it's likely to involve equipment. Someone needs to make sure that the people are knowledgeable about their role in the rescue and they need to know what equipment is available and how it's going to be used. If we're having a, a cherry picker to do the rescue, we need to make sure we have a, a trained operator of that cherry picker. Make sure the plan exists and is workable. At every stage, I mentioned the fact that a building site is a, is a continuing um, project. It changes on, a, on an hourly basis. Someone needs to make that decision that the rescue can be affected at every stage of the construction. And finally, make sure that every, uh, we regularly review the plans to rescue people from, from safety nets. That is my 20 minutes. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Some, some people will include, the question was, should the rescue plan be part of the method statement? Yes, some, some people will include that as a, an annex in the method statement. Um, others will include it as a separate document that goes alongside the risk assessment method statement and uh, the rescue plan as well. But, but the process, the, the words and the, the, the theory and the, the management of that plan must be, must be, must be there. <coughs>